so happy and talking, and it's good. Is there, if there's any guests, then welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. And if there are not guests and you are a regular, welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. Um, I am not Brian Boysen, in case you were wondering. He has not changed radically. Um, so let's begin this morning with prayer and thank God that we can gather together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love that we can share with each other and that we can experience that frees us from the darkness, that helps us to see truth, that helps us to be a light. Be with us, help us to worship you well to hear your words, and to be strengthened through the week. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> we have a couple of announcements, and there might be more. If there are, wave, wave your hands around wildly. Uh, as you know, Brian is on his sabbatical, and um, if there's any need to communicate, uh, Nancy will be the point of contact to do that, so call the church office if you have something that needs to be taken care of. And then we need to save the date for BBS, which is moving closer and closer. We're doing what's called SunSpark Labs, and it's going to run July 13th through the 17th, so it's always a good and exciting time to connect with lots of little ones from the area that we don't always get to see on Sundays. And sometimes there are people that have never been here before, so it's a good way to get connected with the community. Um, that is all that is in the bulletin. Are there other announcements out there? Surely.
Thank you. 
read to you today from two, uh, two takes on an interesting reality. <laughs> One from Matthew's Gospel, our Lord Jesus uh, teaching uh, with a parable. And then from uh, the aging John's revelation when he was on the island of Patmos, First, let's, uh, let's listen to God's word as it comes to us in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at uh, verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like... Did you get that? This is the intro. The kingdom of heaven is like... Ready? Okay. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he said. Servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvester, First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Huh. And John's take on it uh, much later in his life, we read of it in his revelation in chapter 14, verse 14. John says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one 
like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? God grant that what I say and what we hear today will be the means by which you speak to our hearts. And I pray you of your mercy that you would give us the further grace when we hear the truth to recognize it as such and to heed it and to live it so that our lives will ring true to you. In Jesus precious name. Amen. So, <clears throat> today's parable raises a question that people have been asking for literally thousands of years. The question is, what are we to do with the weeds in God's garden? We could state the problem in more scholarly terms, we could ask, what are we to make of the problem of theodicy and the ideology of evil? <laughs> but if it's all the same to you, I'd just rather ask, what are we supposed to do with those weeds in God's garden? Now, looking at the parable, we can certainly see it as a picture of life in general, but I also want to see it as a picture of the church in particular. Now when you look at it as a picture of our life in general, it rings true, doesn't it? I mean, we all have some wheat in our lives, those things that are good and wholesome and productive. But we also have some weeds, those things that creep in and if left unchecked, can end up doing us a lot of harm. Diverting our attention, uh, sapping our strength, and robbing us of joy. So my question is, what can we learn from this parable about weed control in our lives? And in the church. And I hear this parable teaching us three things. First, the parable reminds us that people long for perfection. You notice that when the farmhands discovered weeds growing among the wheat, they wanted to go out and pull them up, right? Now, you may not, not call that a longing for perfection, but I'm persuaded that God has planted in our hearts a basic discontent with anything less than right. Anything second rate. The Bible speaks of it in any number of ways. Jesus talked about it as, as a, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, for wanting things to be really right. It's that deeply ingrained attraction that we all feel for the very best that life has to offer. That's what we long for. And as a rule, this drive for perfection is more evident in youth that, than it is in those of us of advancing years. And despite the myriad reasons why young people these days have plenty of good reasons to be cynical, younger people still tend to be idealists. And frankly, I'm delighted. To me, that idealism is, is a blessed reassurance that God's image, however 
sullied or tarnished it may have become, that God's image is, is set deep in the human spirit. And let's face it, however, however awkward it may be for us older folks to deal with youthful idealism sometimes, the human race would be in sad shape if every child began life with no drive to be the best, to want the best, to do their best, to strive for perfection. Now that same truth that applies to people in general applies to the Church of Jesus Christ in particular. The Church needs idealists. And I'll tell you why. After any church has been around for a while, including this church, there is a temptation to begin to settle for being simply one among many good social service agencies that make life more pleasant by promoting things like family values, patriotism, good citizenship, there's nothing wrong with those things, of course. The problem, however, is that Jesus did not establish his church to be one more social service agency. He gave us a commission that no other group on earth can claim as its own. We are to make disciples of all kinds of people, baptize them into the name of Jesus, and teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. That's our unique mission, and we need those idealists in our midst so that we never lose sight of that. Perfect, we're not. But being imperfect does not absolve us of the responsibility to carry out that great commission. You've been chosen to represent God, to be the body of Christ in this city, which means that you better get on with the job of being transformed day by day into his likeness. That is, to strive for perfection. God planted that desire for perfection deep in our souls, so there's something in us that wants to make things right, to, to pull up the weeds, to use the language of the parable. That's the first thing I find this parable teaching us. But there's more. When the farmhands asked the landowner if he wanted them to pull up the weeds, he replied, no, no. Uh, let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. Now, there's an unexpected twist. Remember, Jesus began this parable by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like like this. So when Jesus has the master in the story tell his servants, you just let the wheat and the weeds grow together, he was reminding us that even though God has given this, us this desire for ultimate perfection, we better learn to live with imperfection in the meantime. And the sooner we come to terms with that uncomfortable paradox, the better. Let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest, he said. Well, that certainly rings true of life in general. Common sense teaches us that people who have learned to live with imperfection generally live less stressful lives than those of us who simply can't settle for anything less than perfect. <coughs> We know that's true. So why is it then that when it comes to the church, we often ignore that truth? Some churches seem to have this idea that all their problems would be solved if they just had the right pastor. You ever notice that? If a church with that kind of attitude were to call pastor perfect, someone who was a what, a gifted preacher, a, a great uh, scholar, a skilled counselor, a compassionate caregiver. I can tell you right now that after the honeymoon was over, they'd be looking for a replacement. You know why? 
for two obvious reasons. In the first place, there is no such critter as past or perfect. And second, even if they were to call such a person, those people would find something to complain about. You want hard evidence of that? Look what they did to Jesus. And he was perfect. Of course, the other side of the coin is just as true. There are those pastors who really think there is a perfect church somewhere out there. They're convinced that all the problems that they face are due to those imperfect congregations that they're obliged to serve. So off they go to one church after another in search of that ideal flock where there's no weeping nor wailing, no gnashing of teeth, where <laughs> neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. <laughs> Give me a break. The sooner all Christians reconcile themselves to the fact that the wheat and the weeds grow together in all churches and in all pastors, the sooner we can get on with the business that we've been commissioned to do, that is, to grow up in Christ. Church, of course, isn't the only guilty party. This disorder is endemic in our society. Television offers us a daily parade of commercials masquerading as helpful advice. As if they really had our best interests at heart, advertisers will try to convince us that if we'll just buy their product, we'll miraculously begin to lead happier, younger, more exciting lives than we've ever known before. And that's bad enough. But the point at which, in my humble but correct opinion, <laughs> advertisers become criminally negligent is when they use their considerable powers of persuasion to convince us that expecting and even demanding perfection right here and now is preferable to learning to live with the imperfections in ourselves and in those we love. In our quest for perfection, cheap imitations sometimes masquerade as answers. That may be what Jesus was talking about when, in the parable when he implied that the weed that was sown in the wheat field was the bearded darnel, uh, a weed that when it's long, young, it looks just like wheat. It's only in the fullness of time, it's only when things come to a head we finally realized that what appeared to be good grain at first was really a noxious weed. So watch out, the parable says. Don't be fooled by appearances. There are things that may look good at first glance, but later they can prove to be clearly evil. Guys, when it comes to living as God's men and women in the world, the beginning of wisdom is accepting the fact that there are going to be weeds, imperfections, in all situations, in all people. So if you're smart, you won't go looking for perfection in this world because you're not going to find it. Let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the hearts, he said. Accept it. And that brings us to the third and in some ways the most challenging lesson in this parable. When Jesus had the landowner in the story say, let them both grow together until the harvest, he was laying down an essential rule for living under God's authority. Ready? We are to wait. And that waiting, I'd remind you, is not a suggestion. It's an order. Wait. But what are we waiting for? That command to wait can be taken at least two ways. On the one hand, Jesus may have been saying, wait, wait until the final harvest of souls. Wait for judgment day. Right? At that point, according to our lesson from Revelation, the angel will 
swing his sickle over the earth, and evil will be banished to hell, and the elect will be gathered to heaven. Some people don't like to even think about hell. The very idea that some people will be eternally separated from God causes them deep distress. As well it should. Now, if that's the harvest to which Jesus was referring when he told us to wait, allow me to make two comforting observations about this parable. First, in, order, in, in ordering us to wait for judgment day, Jesus was telling us, in effect, we're not responsible for deciding who the wheat and who the weeds are. That is, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's the harvester's call, not ours. The second comment I'd make is that if Jesus is talking here about waiting for judgment day, then this parable is a gracious reminder of how profoundly patient God is with all those weeds, with those who do evil. According to the parable, God waits until the last possible moment before pronouncing judgment on who's in and who's out. But as I said, that command to wait can be taken a couple of ways. Jesus may have been referring here to the last judgment. But when the master said in the parable, let them both grow together, Jesus may have been saying to us, in effect, wait, wait until the fruit becomes evident. You remember that in talking about those who are good and evil, Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. Well, if that's what he was talking about here, then maybe, maybe Jesus was telling us to be patient because the fruit of a person's life is the real test of whether or not they're worth saving. And therein lies our only hope. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we know that God is not only profoundly patient, he is amazingly gracious. In fact, God can lay hold of a person's life, a person who to all appearances is, is leading a totally unproductive, weed-infested life, and transform that person into someone whose life bears fruit fit for eternity. I know that's true. I know how God can change people's lives. I know it's true when I call, recall how God took a, a hard-bitten slave trader and transformed into a man who devoted the rest of his life to set people free. His name was John Newton. And he wrote about his conversion in words that were eventually set to music Music that has given hope to countless souls. He wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I know about God's amazing grace when I think of how the Lord captured the heart of an arrogant, hard-drinking, womanizing young Irishman. His reputation at university as a brilliant scholar was rivaled only by his egotistical disdain for the Christian faith. And God laid hold of this young man named Clive Staples Lewis and shaped him into one of Christianity's most effective defenders of the faith. And although they had to wait long to see it, the fruit of C.S. Lewis's life is manifest. And I know beyond a doubt that God can take a life that seemed to be going nowhere and give it purpose 
and direction and unutterable joy. I know it's true because one night, 52 years ago, almost to the day, God put his hand on me and he said, you're my child, I love you, and I have a job for you to do. And those who had been praying for me, though they had to wait long to see it, they were there to celebrate my new birth. And I pray that my life, too, will bear fruit. So I urge you to be patient. Wait on the Lord. In this parable, Jesus reminds us that even though we all long for perfection, we better learn to live with imperfection. He reminds us that it is not for us to decide who's in and who's out. God will ex exercise that sovereign judgment. He simply commands us to wait. But we don't have to wait in fear or uncertainty because in Jesus God has not only showed us his profound patience but also his amazing grace. And as Martin Luther would want to say at the end of his sermons, well, that's enough for today. <laughs> Let's pray. Let's pray today, okay? God, you're so good to us. Far, far better and far more loving and far more patient than we deserve. I suppose we'll have more to say about that in the future. But in the meantime, God, give us the grace to exercise a patience that we cannot generate on our own. We know how things are supposed to be. We know how we could correct some other people's lives if they just listen to us. We know how to set things right. We just want it now. God, teach us the grace of patience. Teach us the value of forbearance and long-suffering. <coughs> and teach us, if you will, please, of your mercy, not only to wait patiently, but to find joy in the waiting because we're waiting with you. Thank you. Stand up and let's do a song together. There are so many different seasons in our lives, and it's important for us to praise the Lord during all those seasons, whatever whatever season you're in. Every 
blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name.
us to trust that you will govern our resources and that we can be like the birds and not worry about what we'll eat or what we'll wear. Take care of our faith and our resources so that we can be generous. Help us to take care of our church and to take care of the ministries of our church. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you that you take care of us and help us to see you in the midst of suffering and in the midst of joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Do we have one more song, James? Or hey, hey all right. <laughs> Oh, 